Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Sarah Pinborough. Pinborough is the number one Sunday Times bestselling and New York Times bestselling author of the psychological thriller Behind Her Eyes, which was turned into a popular Netflix series. During her career, she has published more than 20 novels and several novellas. Sarah's latest novel is Insomnia. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about your new novel, Insomnia, yet, how would you describe the novel? Um, it's about a woman called Emma who is, on the surface, she kind of has everything. She's a successful lawyer. She's got two great kids. She's got a stay-at-home husband. Um, but underneath it, she's doing that thing that, you know, she's paddling like mad and then she stops sleeping. Um, and lots of strange things start happening. And her, it, her mother went mad when her mother was on the night of her 40th birthday and did something terrible. And Emma's 40th birthday is approaching. Uh, and she starts to doubt her own sanity and wonders if she's going to do something equally terrible. But obviously it's quite twisty turny and it's got a bit of weird, but it kind of came out of, it's got, it doesn't mention the pandemic at all because, you know, I quite frankly could live without hearing about that for the rest of my life. <laughs> but um, she, it kind of came out of this feeling I had, especially with all my friends who are married with kids and, and they have high powered jobs. But suddenly in the pandemic, they were not only doing their own jobs, they were sorting out all the kids stuff. They were doing the homeschooling and everybody stopped sleeping, you know? So I thought, well, I'm going to tap into that anxiety, that female anxiety and lack of sleep that seems to happen to us as we hit our our older years, as it were. So yeah, that's roughly what it's about. That's great. Well, I know that that you're, you know, your own kind of a schedule of writing kind of one um, commercial thriller per year. I'm curious, how do ideas end up coming to you? Do you ever feel like you're you're desperate for an idea for your next novel? Or do you, do you have... <laughs> always no to be honest i'm not really one a year i'm kind of one every 18 months because okay <laughs> i'm doing other things i'm doing uh and i think there was two years between between two of them because my dad died and also i'm working on a lot of other projects but yeah i do find i do find the ideas hard and i, I especially find them hard um to fit into the psychological thriller parameters you know because mine tend to sit on the edge of that there's always a little bit of something odd going on in them. Uh, and when I before I wrote Insomnia, I handed in about ten outlines to my UK editor, and she basically was like, "No, this one's not a thriller. This one's not thriller enough. This one has, some, <laughs> you know, got the right kind of female lead." So yes, I do find it tricky, and you know, I'm not sure how many more I'll write. You know, I mean, I, I I may well still write some, but I may write some other books as well, just as a sort of palate cleanser, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Well, what but I'm really th- proud of this one. I'm really proud of this one. That's great. That's great. What was your initial writing journey that led you to writing and getting your very first novel published? Oh, God, I'm so old. It was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I was a horror fan. I am a horror fan. Um, and I, I grew up reading horror. I don't read it so much now. I watch a lot of horror movies, but I don't read it so much. But obviously I grew up, I was, you know, I'm going to be 50 next month. So I grew up in the Stephen King, James Herbert, Dean Koontz heyday, you know? Sure. So they're very much the kind of books I was reading. And when I decided to have a go at writing one, I'd always written short stories and bits and pieces, you know, as a hobby. And then I was living in Devon and I was really bored and I was married and, I just thought, right, I'm going to just have a go at writing a book. You know, it's always been in the back of my head. So I started to write this horror novel. And the the market in England was was terrible for horror. I think it had been broken. And I think in America too at the time. Uh, My first book came out in December 2004. So I had been on holiday. It might have even been when I got married, actually, in Vegas, as you do. (laughs) And I picked up some paperbacks at the airport that were published by a company called, in England we'd say Leisure, in America Leisure, Leisure Books. <laughs> um, and they were part of a bigger company called Dorchester. And they very much published the kind of paperbacks you get in a drugstore or, you know, a supermarket, that kind of thing. 
um, those sort of mass market paperbacks. Uh, so I sent off the, the sort of when I got when I sorry I picked up these books and then I, I thought these are really fit what I'm doing. You know, this could be a good fit mm-hmm. for me because I hadn't got any traction sending off in the UK. So I did send it off and they bought it. And then, yeah, so I wrote my next six books. I was teaching and I wrote, they, they came out every nine months. I wrote horror, six straight horror novels. Um, and then I was, I was really, really fed up with writing very defined horror. You know, it had to, there was, you, couldn't, you couldn't blend a genre. And I really, really had started to feel that as much as I love horror elements, I didn't always want to be that that in that box you know in that category mm-hmm. um and I was gonna get it was it was a weird sort of a weird mix of circumstances I decided to take six months out of teaching everyone always says when did you decide to go full-time and I didn't decide to go full-time because I, I think it's quite a precarious thing to do for a writer <laughs> I think you can have a very a very very good writing career while having a job you know and paying the bills because as we know it doesn't always pay well so I decided to take six months off. So I wrote two tortured novels for the BBC, which they didn't pay huge amounts. But for me at the time, it seemed like a lot of money. And it gave me a bit of saving. And I rented my house out and I was going to go to America. A friend of mine was teaching in America. And I was going to go and stay near her for six months. And then the dollar and the pound all crashed. So my money wasn't going to go. Well, the dollar did crash. The pound obviously did. My money wasn't going to go as far in America as I thought it would. So I stayed in England and I went to a fantasy con convention, which is like, you know, for fantasy writers in the UK, which I would not have gone to if I'd gone to America, had my plans gone the way I wanted. But while I was there, one of my horror novels was up for an award and an editor at Galance, which is a subsection of Orion, she said to someone, oh, is Sarah really glued to writing horror? And thankfully the person she asked said no she wants to do something else and in the six months in my my plan for the six months was I wanted to write a paradise lost retelling in a kind of dystopian crime story which I'd started to plan out so she then said to me oh do you want to come for lunch and Mark Chabon who's he's a fantasy writer and he also he now writes um Wilbur Smith's new books I didn't realize that yeah, the new, the the most recent one. It, I mean, they're, they're very obvious. It says with Mark Chapman. Sure, on sure. The front yeah, of them, yeah. I'm not giving away any trade secrets. No, no. Um, uh, but he said to me, number one, she's not asking you for lunch if she doesn't want to buy a book from you. So go in with your pitch ready. And then and it was like such good career advice. He said, and also, if this is going to be your first kind of UK deal, why pitch one book, make it a trilogy, and get you know get security for three books which was a very, very sensible move. So I spent the next week really kind of, you know, planning out this trilogy and she bought it. So I never went back to teaching after that, you know, so that was my start. And then it was, you know, I wrote books for Galantz, various different types, and I wrote for Quercus. I wrote some historical horror novels for them. And then and then Harper asked me to pitch to them and, and I pitched them behind her eyes and, and that was my big change. So that was my potted history of 20 years nearly. God, where does the sure. time go? Well, well, I'm curious, what what is kind of like the difference for you from writing one of those early horror novels to now kind of the commercial thrillers that you are writing? About a million dollars. <laughs> That's a good um, answer. Aside from the money, oh man! I mean, like, I am scared to even look at one of those books now. I mean, I don't. I don't think there's any problem with necessarily the stories per se. Like, I I went through a phase of being quite embarrassed by them, but you know, I've had people say that they still love them better than some of my more recent books. <laughs> so the stories I don't have a problem with, but they they didn't teach you anything in the editing. You know, they didn't edit really. They just would change got to gotten, right. and Americanize it, and it would go out. And so it wasn't until Really, I was I was at Galant, and then obviously with Harper. That your writing gets better because you get so used to those edits coming back with your sentences being restructured, and you, we all have those words like "just" that you completely overuse. And so I think, I, I, and I think I've, I'm much more aware of, 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 of telling my own stories now. I think when you start out, you always try and mimic your idols to a certain extent. So I was writing like horror novels that I would read in the 90s and 80s, you know? 
Sure. And now, let's see, I'm not doing that. Uh, but I say, I mean, we still mimic. You know, if you read a really great book by someone, you think, oh, I want to write a book like that rather than just enjoying it for its own thing. But yeah, I think the difference, the difference as well is obviously, and this is a first world problem, if ever there was one, the more successful you are, the more pressure there is on you to stay that way. <laughs> you know, and so they want you to write a similar kind of book to the one you wrote before. And, and I've never been very good at that. You know, so my, so my, I'm curious, how do you deal with that pressure? I mean, you mentioned earlier this process. Of I hand in 11 outlines before yeah, I, I find work. Um, yeah, well, you know, um, I said this in, in a newspaper article last year, so I'm not saying anything that my editor doesn't know. But um, when the pandemic came along, and I, I, you know, we all thought it was Captain Trips and we, you know, we were all going to die. And, you know, obviously, sadly, a lot of people did. But I remember sitting in my house. I live on my own with my dog. And we had this beautiful spring. It was beautiful weather. It was, And we were in full lockdown. And it was, you know, like now we kind of are a bit blasé about it. We, the terminology that we all use is all new and stuff. But then the, just the silence of the, the town I live in was strange. And mm-hmm. sitting in your garden, not hearing anything. And I was trying to work. And I was trying to come up with ideas, obviously, for insomnia um, before it was insomnia. And I remember thinking, the point of doing this job ages ago when I started out was to tell stories. And I, you know, really excited about telling stories. And I've been very lucky in a lot of ways. And I've saved, I'm not, you know, some people are really stupid. Well, that's a bit harsh. But <laughs> some people, when they get a success, they think it's there forever. And so they might get a big paycheck and then they go and buy a big house or a big flash car or all these things. And I'm really non materialistic. I really don't care about stuff. You know, I like nice dinners and that mm-hmm. that's my sort of spending thing. So I've got, you know, my house is like just a little three bed semi detached and, you know, I don't have a big flash car or any of those things. So I've got money in the bank. You know, I, I, I can, I can be more relaxed sure. about my career. So I, I, I just sat down and I thought to myself, well, why am I stressing about trying to, fit into this lane that you know that oh the psychological thriller lane where there are some people who are really amazing at it and they can write a book a year and they can do all this stuff and I'm not that person I'm not a a natural psychological thriller writer so I was like right from now on I'm just going to write the books I want to write and if they sell they sell and if they don't I'm in trouble but you know I'm not going to be pressured to be oh you've got to be in Sunday Times top 10 or you've got to hit x amount of sales that's actually not my problem that's a publisher's problem you know <laughs> yeah um, so, so, so is, this, I, is this your way of announcing that you're you're making a big departure after insomnia <laughs> well yes <laughs> um, well maybe you know but that but it fed into insomnia actually because insomnia although it is a psychological thriller has a lot of elements that make it very much a my kind of story so it's not as it's not as straightforward a psychological thriller as as some. It's definitely got weird elements in the way that Behind Her Eyes had weird elements in, you know, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, I think as well, it's not just the pandemic. It's turning 50. It's all that stuff. You think, well, sure. you know, have a go at do, doing other things. So yep. that probably the death of my career right there. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going to give it a so- go. Stop avoiding your erectile dysfunction issue. Peak Performance for Men is offering your best offer yet. Call today to book your free consultation and free blood flow evaluation. 1-800-210-8181. Peak Performance for Men helps over 80% of men who receive the treatment experience long-term improvement. Let the experts at Peak Performance for Men help you today. All it takes is one phone call for a free consultation, free blood flow evaluation. Call 1-800-210-8181. That's 1-800-210-8181. So what is your writing process at this point? And has it changed over the years? When you, for example, you, you wrote those 10 ideas and then the 11th one was insomnia. Um, when you sat down to write insomnia, did you have an outline um, uh, or, or is I'm it more organic? Planner. I've always been a planner. I always have to have the ending. You know, I always have to have the ending in place. I have to see the entire ending. Um, and then I can kind of plan. A, I plan. I'll put 10 pegs in. I try and find like some key plot points. And then I try and plan like 10,000 words at a time. 
And the the plan gets more detailed as I go along and get deeper in. You know, at the beginning, you're kind of treading on thin ice, trying to find your way in. Sure. Um, I find it it's harder now because I'm I do quite a lot of film and TV stuff, and you have to plan quite thoroughly for that. You know, they do want very detailed outlines before you start and all this stuff. But so when I go back to writing a book. I have to remind myself that's not how I write a book. A book is a little bit more organic. It's a, a book somewhere in the middle. So, I mean, I do plan, but I tend to plan so that I can break the plan. Sure. Um, but uh, but the ending never changes. Once I start, the ending's pretty locked in. Got it. But it's, you know, my, when I started out, I was very concerned with um, hitting the word counts and yeah, I think I'd read somewhere 2,000 words a day. I think it was because someone said Stephen King wrote 2,000 words a day. And then I kept hearing this 2,000 words a day thing. So I kind of felt that if I hadn't written 2,000 words a day, that was a fail. <laughs> but as I've got older and wiser and more cynical, I think there's a lot to be said for the thinking time. Sure. You know, and if you only write 500 words, but you've come up with a cracking reveal or twist, it's a day's work. You know, and, yeah, and I definitely. see some people, they, they go on social media and they're always like, oh, I've just written five and a half thousand <laughs> words a day. And I'm like, well, most of those are going to be shit, you know, yeah. <laughs> unless you're a genius. Because I just don't think you can, you, you know, depending, I mean, some people are writing a much faster pace, kind of like, you know, they're not looking to write something as in depth. But for me, I'm, I couldn't. The only time I write 5,000 words is when I'm nearly at the end. And then I know that the edit notes are always going to come back going, yeah, can we slow that down? And so, you know. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? I hate writing advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think mainly because it's also subjective, isn't it? Like if it's worked for you, you think it's good advice, but it's not necessarily good advice for everybody else. Um, I do think there are things to be said for ignoring social media because I was very lucky. God, I do sound old. But, you know, when I was coming up through the ranks, there just wasn't Twitter and Facebook and all those things. Facebook kind of came in, but not in the way it is now. Right. And Twitter definitely where, you can, you know, you can follow loads of authors and you're hearing constantly what they're thinking and seeing their successes. And it's very easy to believe that every writer out there is a massive success. And that you're the failure, you know, because of mm -hmm. the way people present themselves and their careers and all that stuff. But the way my advice would be, actually, it's a long road and it's not a straight one. You know, there are ups and there are downs. It's not like a career where you think, right, if I work really hard, I'm going to climb up this ladder and it's going to be an upward trajectory. Right. You can be a brilliant writer and have an amazing bestseller. And then your next book might not land or your editor leaves or you get orphaned or you know, you know, whatever, there's a pandemic. So, you, you know, like I had, when Dead to Her came out in America, we were so excited because we had this big airport special thing going on with Hudson's. And of course, then the pandemic came and all the airports closed. <laughs> so there's no one buying my airport special edition. And a friend of mine got a Richard and Judy book club for her book and all the WA Swiss were closed. So, so, you know, there are bits, there are things you can't control. But the only thing you can control is trying to be better with every book, which won't always work, but as, as long as you're trying, and to just focus on your own storytelling and not to be swayed by what everybody else is doing. And now that I've started, you can't stop me with writing advice that I hate. <laughs> um, I would say one key thing, which is nothing to do with writing, and it's just be nice. You know, like be nice to editors, be nice to publicists. When you go to events, be nice to people. That you don't be a diva, none of that, because you you might get fired and you might need another editor. And if you've been a diva, who's going to want to work with you? You know, it's that kind of thing. I think just just treat people nicely and don't, don't take yourself seriously. Take the work seriously. Sure, that's that's what it sums up as. I think that's great. So, have you started working on another novel now? No, <laughs> no, I had, and then I've sacked it off. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got a film I've got to finish writing and I'm working on a couple of TV projects, but I've got a notebook where I'm jotting down ideas for the next book. Um, so I roughly know what zone I'm in, but I don't have the whole story yet. So, got it. but I'm not stressing about it. I'm tired of stressing about things. So I'm going to just try and enjoy it. Um, 
So, yeah. And, you know, some is now out yet. And then the paperback will be out. So I've got time. That's sure. what I'm telling myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I what? Can't, I can't see me drinking straight from the whiskey bottle. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh my gosh, so many! I've read, well, I've been. I went on holiday, so I read about four books in a week, which is, is rare. You know what it's like when you're writing and all sorts of things. Um, I read a great book that isn't out yet called "A Tidy Ending" by Joanna Cannon. She wrote "The Trouble with Goats and Sheep." It was a big hit over here. I don't know if it, I don't know how it did there, mm-hmm. but I'd kind of avoided her books because I thought I thought she was going to be too literary for you know too highbrow for me. Sure. Because I just thought she had, you know, everyone was raving about her and all that stuff. And it's such a good, but it's beautifully written, but it's such a dark, funny kind of thriller and very cleverly put together. Really enjoyed it. Um, Sundial by Catriona Ward, uh, who wrote The Last House on Needless Street. Um, Another great book, another great female writer. Paul Cleave, The Quiet People, I really enjoyed, which because the the main characters are writers as well. And um, their child goes missing. And it's very, it's kind of gone girly in some ways, you know, but it's very mm-hmm. arch. It's very, it's very good. Uh, what else have I read? Alice Feeney, I'm a massive fan of these days. And Samantha Dowling. And uh, Sarah Langan's Good Neighbours, I really enjoyed. Too many at the moment. It's really great, isn't it, to have <laughs> so many to recommend, you know? It really is. It really is. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? In a quiet corner, crying into my gin. <laughs> if they can find me uh, on Twitter, mainly, I'm Sarah Pimbra. It's a very exciting name there uh, on Twitter. And I'm Sarah Pimbra Books on Instagram. Great. Facebook, I just keep for like family and stuff. So that's sure. Awesome. Well, again, we've been speaking with best-selling writer Sarah Pinborough. Sarah's latest novel is Insomnia. The book is available now, so go buy a copy. Sarah, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this was great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Insomnia by Sarah Pinborough, read by Sarah Durham, available from Harper Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. There's someone in the house. It's not a complete thought, but something feral, more instinctive. And I sit up, suddenly awake, my heart racing. The clock clicks to 1.13am, and I stay very still, listening hard. Sure, I'm going to hear a creak from the hallway or see a threatening shadow emerge from a dark corner of the room. But there's nothing just the patter of rain on the windows and the hum of night quiet. My skin has prickled. Something woke me, not a dream, something else. Something in the house. I can't shake the feeling, like when I was small and the nightmares would grip me so hard I would be sure I was back in that night and my foster mother would run in to calm me down before I woke the whole family. Robert is fast asleep, on his side facing away from me. I don't wake him. It's probably nothing, but still, I'm alert with worry. The children. I won't be able to get back to sleep until I've checked on them, and so I get up, shivers trembling at my body from my bare feet on the carpet, and I creep out onto the landing. I feel very small as I look along the central corridor, the gloom making it appear endless, a monster's yawning mouth ahead of me. I walk forward. I am a mother and a wife, a career woman. This is my house, my safe place, and wish I'd brought my phone with me to use as a torch. I peer over the landing banisters. Nothing moves in the dark shadows below, no thump of burglars shifting possessions in the night, no menace. A flurry of wind drives the rain hard into our cathedral feature window, startling me. I go to the end of the corridor where it cuts into the wall, a perfect arch of black. I cut my hands around my eyes and press my face against the cold glass, but all I can make out is the vague shape of trees. No light. No activity. Still, 
I shiver again as I turn back and head down the L-bend ahead to the kids' rooms, footsteps dancing on my grave. I feel better once I've pushed open Will's door. My little boy, five years old and at big school now, is asleep on his back. The dinosaur duvet kicked away and his dark hair so like mine is mussed up from sweat. Maybe he's been having a bad night too. I carefully cover him up, but gentle as I'm trying to be, he stirs and his eyes open. Mummy? He's blurry, confused. But when I smile, he does too, and wriggles onto his side. His drawing book is under his pillow and I slide it out. No wonder you woke up, I whisper, sleeping on this. It's open on his most recent enthusiastic crayon drawing, and I turn it this way and that in the gloom, trying to make out what it is. If I'm honest, it looks like a dog that's been run over. Twice. It's a dinosaur, Will says, and laughs and then yawns, as if even he knows drawing may not be his finest skill, and he's cool with that. Of course it is. I put the notebook on the table by his bed and kiss him goodnight. He's almost asleep again already and probably won't even remember this in the morning. I go to Chloe's room next, and she too is lost to the world, blonde hair fanned out on the pillow, a sleeping princess straight from a fairy tale. Even though at 17 and a staunch modern feminist, she'd be quick to tell me that fairy tales are misogynistic rubbish. I go back to my room ridiculing myself for having been so afraid. I get back into bed and curl up, Robert barely stirring. It's only 1.30. If I fall asleep now, I can get another four hours in before I have to get up. Sleep should come easily. It always has done in this busy, exhausting, exhilarating life I lead. So I snuggle down and wait to drift.